This is an interesting topic and I've seen at my own user group that that spawns a lot of discussions. But um, as I only have a half a session, I would like to have the most of the discussion after uh, I'm through. Um, but feel free to ask questions. And so <clears throat> what I want to talk about is um, what, what we can learn from comparing two of the uh, greatest communities on C++, which is the Boost community and the Qt community. And yeah, a quick word about me. I'm uh, organizing Meeting C++, which started kind of five years ago here at C++, um, C++ now, and um, work as an evangelist for C++ today. Well, that's basically the role I see myself in. I'm supporting the user groups. I'm trying to, to work also with trolls and with Qt and other everyone in the C++ community. But, you know, let's get started. So <clears throat> I just want to give you a quick introduction into both, I guess you're familiar with Boost probably, but maybe a bit about Qt and maybe about a few, a few things about Boost you don't know about. Um, and also I want to, you know, kind of the title of my talk is to what, what, what I learned, so I have a slide on that. And of course, um, I also want to, to talk about what actually would we need as a C++ community today, because um, you can see that there is a certain void uh, which isn't being filled currently and which is growing and we should see how we uh, react to this. And of course, as this is C++ now and former BoostCon, I'm gonna focus a bit more on Boost then on Qt. Um, and so there have been a lot of expectations on this talk and I'm not really gonna go deep into uh, the code, for example. We are not gonna see a lot of code on this talk. Um, also, I, some people seem to have the expectation that we are only able to learn from the errors which other people do. And I think that it, that's the wrong approach. I think we should look like what does Qt better or where could Boost learn or where could, Bo could Qt learn and be a bit more positive. And yeah, I've been reaching out to the Qt community and I consider myself a part of uh, the C++ community. I'm not a member of Qt or of Boost internally. Um, and <clears throat> so I, I did a survey on over my own Twitter account to see like just how many people use it and of course this is a, a bit boost favored I would say because uh, Qt has like uh, 15,000, 17,000 followers on Twitter and so you see um, the interesting point actually is 20%, almost 20% don't use neither boost nor Qt today. Um, the combination of both is also very popular and then there's a lot of people which are still using Boost. Um, so, quick word on Boost. Boost um, has its origins in a standard meeting and um, has been very, very close to the standard and comes from this time when the first standard was created and was also a reaction to the first C++ standard to create an, an organization or a place where libraries could be collected and proven for the standard. That was the original role of Boost and that is also why it understands itself as a collection of libraries which a rather loose coupling. Um, in, the la in the later years um, we've seen here at uh, C++ now a lot of, lots of talk on uh, how to modularize Boost and how to um, maybe even provide a package manager and there's some projects on this being presented here in the last years. Um, not, all of the, not all of them are still alive of those projects so we have to see that's an open uh, thing for Boost I think, the modularization and uh, the age of package managers which is now also coming to C++. And yeah, Qt on this on other hand is, isn't influenced by the standard or by a group of people which creates a standard. Uh, Qt is based on its own ideas, it's um, heavily influenced by the object orientation, uh, which was popular in the 90s, where it also has its root, roots and the ideas which were made popular through Java and other languages. Um, so you kind of can diss it as a JDK of C++. Um, 
and it understands itself as an application framework like we had uh, so other uh, application frameworks like WX widgets. Um, so they try to provide everything you need to write an application on C++. And so if we compare this, we see that both libraries come or both, both organizations come out of a similar age. Um, Boost was founded a bit later. Um, Qt, the first release was in 95, but the ideas and the, the work on Qt started around 91. Um, a big difference is that Qt has been from the start on commercial and Boost is a volunteer driven organization which um, has a little bit of, so like from ISO CPP the uh, model of working with committees and um, people volunteering their time for a good cause. Um, and today, Qt is LGPL and uh, commercial available, while Boost is an open source license. And yeah, so you see the difference also very, very, very large in the, in the coding style. Boost always has underst understood itself as um, a pioneering, as uh, really being the, at the front and using the language to its fullest, and there's not really any uh, taboo in using C++ and Boost, you can use it and like people are like really uh, motivated to find new crazy ways of making C++ work at compile time or at runtime. And uh, Qt is quite the opposite. Their approach is uh, we want that our code base is easily usable and that our, our code base which is facing to the user is um, easy to understand and that it's easy to write applications with it while um, Boost has always chosen to be uh, the, the frontier of C++ to be uh, very consistent about uh, innovating C++ and uh, with many libraries over the years we have seen that like libraries like Fusion, uh, Spirit and other things. Um, so while the standardization in 98 stopped um, Boost carried on and a lot of things we see today in the standard are there because Boost uh, gave this community um, a place where they could meet and thrive. Um, well, Qt internally also uses a lot of uh, C++ features. They try to expose only a certain set uh, through their public APIs to the user. And then they have private APIs which uh, use templates, etc. And then the public API, uh, they also have like templated uh, containers, etc. But for example, Qt does not offer any traits, so that's like an, that's one of the things I see that is a big difference. Boost uh, is very much trait based in a lot of places, and especially if you look under the hood, and Qt doesn't um, offer traits. Um, but on, when we look in a, in a, on a different side, uh, when we look away from, from code and look more like, like how, is, how are things organized, um, <clears throat> this used to be BoostCon. And today it's C++ now, since five years. So BoostCon ended in 2011 and then we rebranded this conference to uh, fulfill the role of being a conference also for the new standards and the new age. Uh, which was a great idea, but um, Boost isn't very much a topic anymore here. Uh, there's one talk, and I don't include this talk because this is just a talk about uh, things. So if you, if you, if you then, then we're like at one and a half, but there's uh, the talk yesterday at Boost HANA. Um, it's the only talk which was accepted about Boost, and otherwise there isn't a lot of topics on Boost here uh, publicly. So. Um, also marketing and ways to reach out the Boost community could do a lot better, I think. Um, social media, it's great that you have a Twitter account in the year of 2017. Um, and yeah, there's things like Boost has no blog or no other things, there's a mailing list and there's uh, infrastructure which has, ex has existed for years, but maybe it would be also um, a way to, to, you know, to have a new beginning for Boost with the standards. And on the other hand, Qt is, is through its commercial um, backing and, and that area just a lot better. They have a, a, what they now call Qt World Summit, 
Uh, for years, they used to call these, this event Cute Deaf Days, which was uh, in San Francisco and in Europe, in Munich, and for the last years in Berlin. And then they have a, another event called Academy, which is a KDE Cute Community Gathering um, for more deaf focused and more focused on the community which builds Cute and KDE. And they also do things like they have a booth at Embedded World, uh, where uh, the whole ecosystem of companies working with booths, uh, with Qt, presents themselves. And from the marketing perspective, um, yeah, they have, uh, but one thing I really want to point out, they have paid support. Um, so as for a lot of companies writing applications in C++, it's important that they have like some, some support where they can, um, you know, test their errors against. Um, and they're very, very well um, positioned in having a blog and social media. Um, on the other hand, their website is very commercial and in my opinion, not very deaf friendly. You definitely have to know where to click on and it's very shiny and needs a lot of JavaScript. So um, even that the Boost website is a lot older than that, it's still working very well even on mobile. Um, so actually Boost is with, with, with its website pretty good, but um, that's also something to think about if you should, you know, be in that area, if there should be more invested in, in you know, renewing Boost. Um, and of course, you know, if, if, uh, just think about if you had professional support for Boost or if you had like a commercial uh, user base which is supporting uh, Boost stronger, stronger than it is today. Um, I think that would be very successful because Boost is still used a lot in the industry. Um, and another thing which, which this boils down to is um, Boost has a very strong library focus and I often hear like, you know, C++ programmers are supposed to be uh, library programmers. And while this mindset is, is, is good and it's, 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 it's really a good way to think about writing code, um, Qt, on the other hand, is very successful with having a library mindset, but really being strongly focused on writing applications or making writing applications easy with Qt. And um, they have like an external stakeholder, which is KDE, which is also very important. There are some arrangements, for example, that uh, Qt always stays open source in the case that Qt gets bought by some big blue company. Um, then, and they would choose to publish Qt only on a commercial license, that would be possible. But in that sense, the KDE Foundation would have the right to fork Qt into an MIT license or, yeah, in a very open source license, MIT, I think. Um, and they have, as I mentioned, they have a huge commercial ecosystem. There is the Qt company, which is officially owning Qt. But then there's also companies like KDEP, ICS, Wobok, and lots of other smaller companies which are using Qt and which are integrated into the platform of Qt uh, in showing what they do with it and marketing, con uh, marketing ways and sponsoring. Um, so I think that's... One of the main takeaways when I compared both uh, ways, Boost should maybe think about if we can do something similar, have a commercial ecosystem which uh, uses Boost as a platform. And I've been also had the idea, well, why, not, why not ask everybody on, on my Twitter feed what, what kind of code they write? And it turns out that they write most application code, as you see, and of course, Maybe in, in this room it's different, but um, I think that um, this application side of things is a bit neglected in, in Boost. And maybe, maybe Boost should also have a bit more uh, focus on usability and ensuring that the libraries are nicely interacting. And um, so one example I had when I wrote code this, um, this spring was I needed to copy a directory. 
and boost file system cannot do it. There's a copy directory method, but if you look in the documentation, it tells you, well, that's not what you think it is. And uh, then I said, well, Qt is an application framework. They, they, they can do that. that. That's great. And then, then I looked at the documentation, and I found out that also Qt cannot do it. So one, one. But take a guess who can do it. Uh, C++17, the uh, newer version of file system, which is in C++17, uh, can do it. And I, I hope that this also comes to boost soon. Um, and yeah, with copy options, you, you can all kind of combinations for because a, copying a directory is not that easy as you think. But I think that's, that's a nice implementation. And um, which brings me to, of course, an important topic. Since C++11, we have an active standardization again. And um, we should have a look at how, how do how does this change the environment for communities which are active in C++. Um, Boost has seen the migration of many libraries into the standard, which um, is, of course, a success, but also kind of a curse for Boost, because um, with C++11, I already saw that um, back in the day, you could say, well, let's, let's have shared pointer and bring Boost in, and you, you would have an, an easy argument and then you could, you know, pull the other Boost libraries in later, and just so there are many other libraries like in Boost, uh, which which are good to to just to open the door for Boost and have, bring it into a project. Um, and most of those uh, libraries, which are really useful to the programmer, are now in the standard. So um, if 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 you're like um, trying to to bring Boost into a project because you want to use a certain library, you probably have a harder point to argue today. Um, and then some, some other people argue that Boost uh, has a new role in being the legacy standard support for all those projects which are left behind and are not able to change to a new standard for whatever reason. And there's many projects of that. And that would be a possible role for Boost in the future. But I think that the community which meets here doesn't agree with that role. Um, and yeah, Boost, Boost has a thriving and active community, but I think they they really should have a, a place to, to meet and where it's also visible to the outside. Um, so if, if you want to maintain this, I think probably the best point to do that would be CppCon. And last year I organized a boost meeting at my own conference. That's probably something to do uh, for all conferences which are focused on C++. Um, and on the other hand, Qt. Qt decided last year with uh, 5.6 that 5.6 is a long-term release and that the, the, the version after that, which is 5.7, um, would have C++11 as mandatory. So they took quite a long time to do that and it's quite fitting in the behavior of Qt of being more conservative and... Um, but so they're, they're not like like Boost, like already having like libraries which you can compile, like Boost HANA, and but um, they're acting, and they just announced that five nine is also an LTS. So with six, they might go to C plus plus fourteen. Who knows? Um, but also, they do not see the large value in the standard. They're more seeing C plus plus as a tool, and um, so. It's, it, ha it has to be seen how Qt uh, as a community reacts to the ongoing standardization in the, in the next years. Um, and yeah, then as I said, uh, for, for Boost, its own success and the new standardization has brought, um, with C++14, there are 13 Boost libraries which are in the standard. So for all those libraries, you don't need Boost anymore. And, Often these libraries are improved because uh, Boost, um, these libraries are often not updated to C++11 or just have been later. So these libraries are implemented in 11 or 14. And um, this can lead like to things like faster compile times, etc. cetera. So, um, and yeah, libraries which are currently moving into the standard are 
to my, as I counted, are seven. It's any ASIO, uh, coroutine, file systems, special math functions, range, and variant. Um, that all will take a bit longer probably to, to be in the standard, but the, the ones I think are, which are in C++17, I um, highlighted. And on the other hand, Boost has all these legacy pre-C++11 libraries, which are either poorly maintained because they're just there and they're, they're, they're actually stable. But if, if, if you combine them with C++11 or 14, that can lead to problems like a headless factory and a move only type. Um, there is a round to, to, to fix that and Boost has uh, kind of the, the, the needed things to do that. And of course, yeah, the MPL. Um, there's interesting threats on the MPL on the Boost mailing list that people are not really wanting to maintain it anymore because they don't really know what happens if they touch it or if they remove uh, like old compiler support from it. So there is an ongoing effort to, to replace the MPL. We have HANA, which should be the replacement, and we have other libraries which uh, try to follow the um, a bit more the type-based approach of the MPL in a modern way. Um, and another issue for many people with Boost is if, if you just wanted a bicycle, Boost gives you like everything. You get a plane, you get a ship, you get everything. And it's, it's, but you just wanted a bicycle. You want to, to ride a bike today and you don't want to have an airport. So that's that what I hear from a lot of people that um, through this monolithic release, which back in the day was how you do it and was a great idea. And it's of course that has an advantage that you get all the libraries which you could use. But for, for many people, it's just that they would like to just use the four or five libraries which they need in their project and not have to download and possibly build everything else. So <clears throat> Boost has been moving in the direction of being modular, but that's still in the doing. So that's something where I think Boost really should uh, see that um, that would be a, a very important improvement to Boost, I think. Um, but on the other hand, same is true for, for Qt. Qt also has done uh, a step on modularization, but also they don't have re real modules or something. It's just they have an SDK, they have their own IDE, and um, basically you either can download the, the, the source and compile it, or you get uh, everything what you need in, in one big bundle um, for, um, yeah, as an SDK, and they offer several SDKs, like for example, if you want to develop for Android, you have to download a second SDK, which brings all the, the dependencies for Android. And, but for them, it's more as an application framework, that's how it is. And probably they should also think about moving more into a more modular way where you just can get Qt through a package manager. And there's even a new package manager for Qt, as I saw. Um, but that's all, yeah, yeah, like all package managers just in the beginning for C++ currently. Um, and then of course, you know, it's always when you mention, mention Qt, you, you have people complaining about the mock, uh, which is, uh, for, for Qt people, the mock is fantastic and it's a great tool. And for people which I don't, which don't use Qt, that's kind of weird because they're like, yeah, what, what are you doing with my language? Um, and I use Qt a lot, though I think that the mock is okay as long as I write Qt code. Um, and on the other hand, we see in, like just in, the, in this year, reflection has become very popular and Qt uh, has the mock for a very long time. And that's exactly their purpose why they, they build it in the first time to have reflection-like features, which is used for exposing things to JavaScript and QML. And on the other hand, what, what if, you know, Boost would have been founded with similar ideas of having Fusion or HANA around and somebody would have made the, this uh, preprocessor or compiler extension for Boost, uh, which automatically would make any type um, which has a certain macro or whatever, um, like a Boost type. And the way that didn't happen is probably because Boost has its role and its, its uh, 
roots into being like coming from a more standard point of view and not like um, being like uh, imposing like one framework view on everything. And so that didn't happen. And I don't, yeah, don't want to talk too much about the elephant in the room and get towards, you know, what, what, what um, could Qt learn? Um, I think Qt should learn that they also should offer features to their advanced users. Qt does very, very much a lot of things to, to be easy to use and to be easy for beginners. But if you write a couple of years uh, code in Qt, um, you also should have features available for you which are a bit more advanced. And maybe embrace the C++ 14 standard. And I think, yeah, Boost could learn also a lot. Uh, I think better branding, better marketing, a um, bit more focus on growth and, you know, being exposing people to the idea of Boost and trying to to see how to boost, boost in the new age. Um, visibility in events. I see that there's not a lot of talks being submitted about boost to this conference or to my conference or to, to uh, CPPCon. Um, yeah, be a bit more modern with blocks, social media and website. Um, and so who of you knows what Blomp is? One person. Okay, that's the Boost Library official maintainer program, which is uh, kind of the commercial outreach of Qt, uh, of Boost, uh, which is very well hidden on the website and they, they don't really do a very good job in, in uh, ad advertising that, but they allow companies to have the official Qt uh, Boost logo on the website, etc. if they take over the maintainership of one library or more. And yeah, maybe maybe this is like a sponsoring approach, but maybe they should also accept like companies to be sponsors of Qt, have like a sponsors page, and um, use this uh, financial support then for boosting Boost and being better organized. Um, yeah, an SDK, maybe you know, just focus on modular things, uh, better dev kits, and yeah, maybe a higher resolution logo. And I think both should really reflect on their role in the C++ community and what they want to be in the future. And that's, that's more important than anything for, for us as C++ programmers. Because, you know, with, with the new standard, we see all the people like Herb and Bjarne complaining that too many people come to committee meetings and um, the trend probably goes more that these meetings will grow if they could. So we, we need like a new umbrella organization like the idea what brought Boost to life once uh, needs to be done again and either it's Boost or somebody else will fill this void and we also see that a lot, many many libraries are now on GitHub and it's a different age and um, the uh, GSL um, is a whole different approach it's not a library but it's guidelines and as a CPU, C++ has its own limitations uh, standardization is slow because it has to be slow, um, ISO itself. But the three-year cycle is great. I mean, we, we, need pro we need probably something which, uh, which we can build around that, which um, makes the standardization better and which ensures that um, we have a better understanding on how to standardize C++ outside of ISO. So that uh, we kind of have a, a process which leads to, to being a TS being created outside of ISO and then being moved into ISO or something. I don't know. There are, there are many ideas on this. Um, and yeah, C++ standardization has its own issues. And yeah, as I said, um, we have a lot of initiatives and community and organizations on the one point and we have the committee on the other point and then we have uh, tooling, package managers, commercial companies actually interested in C++ and willing to invest. And we, we need to have something in between. Um, and we have to see how, how do we, do we, how, yeah, what, what, what will fill this void or is, is there like, in, probably not like one thing, but multiple things uh, probably are going to, to fill this in the future. And this is like a, a void where a boost could very well grow in and because they, they are actually, I think, set up to, to reinvent themselves if they wanted. 
And with this, I'm through. Any questions, comments? Yes. Should, should we deprecate some um, compiler support in this? And the question is if you should deprecate some. Like old, old ah, yeah. So should, should you deprecate compiler support and boost? Um, yes and no. I think it would be a good idea to think about versioning and boost and maybe to have two, three, four, zero versions of boost where certain sets of compilers are deprecated. And on, on the other hand, really, we have to decide um, a part of the boost community probably will go into being the role of uh, supporting older compilers and being the um, legacy part of boost. While a lot of people which come here are driven towards um, renewing boost and, re and like really focusing on, on the new C++ which is coming now with 14, 17, etc. So maybe you want to have as every standard a new boost version which uh, puts this standard as, as the supported baseline. Um, but for this you would really have to have a modular boost release which is able to to cover on that and to, to you know deprecate. Also that's another thing, should we deprecate libraries? We have very old libraries, which I don't know if they're still used. I don't know. So, so Jens, what, what do you think is... Um, so I did a couple of years of web development, right? And the web community in general seems to be, I don't know, more open to releasing their, and, and they have communities that are more available and searched in you know, like central places where it doesn't require them to have some formal committee to give them permission to release their library in this community. You know what I mean? Like like the boost kind of it seems mm -hmm. like it does, right? Do you think that there's room for something like that in our C++ community? Or maybe that exists and I'm not aware of it. Um, so the question is, the, the web community is a bit more um, organized in, in the way that they don't need committees or reviews to publish their code. And I think the same thing is true for, 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 um, for C++. We, we have lots of libraries on, um, on GitHub and Eric Niebler's range is, 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 is on GitHub, it's not in Boost. It's not even in the review key, I think. Um, and there's a lot of libraries uh, which are just available and that's... I think the web community understands that it's for them a problem that there's so many Java JavaScript libraries and frameworks which aren't reviewed and which you have to change every few years because something new is hip and popular. So um, I think reviews have their advantage and both Qt and Boost heavily review their code. And maybe we need something like a less strict organization as Boost, which reuse C++ libraries, which are out in the net. Uh, I actually have a quick comment on the how the PT ecosystem on the website, for example, looks like, uh, because. It looks to me that they are pushing the whole QT ecosystem as a whole. And if you come to the QT website and try to find, for example, a QT creator, and you've never been there, you will be spending like lots of time trying to search for it, trying to search for a license for a QT creator that actually doesn't exist on that site. So they have the whole licensing for the whole QT ecosystem, but it doesn't cover QT creator with a separate license. At least you can't find anything on the site. And that's a little bit of, a, of an issue to me because if you comment for one particular part, you just couldn't find it easily. Yeah, so the comment is that the uh, the Qt website can be very uh, very hard to to navigate through to for, to find certain information, and I know that, and it's something they also should work on. But on the other hand, they they are in that part a more marketing driven organization, yeah, which the, which also has its downsides, obviously. not only its advantages. Modularization of boost that, that happened, I don't know, was it three years ago now? But there's a, some 
some attempts to, to separate them or a little bit better by making them separate get sub modules and things like that is it um, do we I haven't heard much about it lately do, do we need to push on that more uh, what can we do there yeah I think so the comment is on boost modularization and if we should push a bit more there as a community and maybe maybe that would be a good thing to do. I think it's it's for, for the future of boost important to to kind of reinvent the way how cute is or how boost is available. I think for boost commu for, for both communities, this is an important topic to, to see that they're available in package managers that it's possible to just have the uh, standardization and the, 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 the library you need and the dependencies and nothing else available. Um, there has been some work on that in, in Boost and I think we should follow that or maybe restart the work if it had some limitations. Um, I remember that a couple of years Ripple was presented as a possible solution to that um, but that's not anymore the case and um, one interesting thing was pointed out to me at the conference here is that CMake support from Qt is done by Qt itself and the CMake support for, for Boost is not coming from the Boost community, it's more like from CMake. And so there's, there's so many things to, to think about uh, what, what makes it easier to use Boost or what makes it easier to to include people into the community that they have access to to the resources they need. There's a comment uh, uh, Boost, uh, to, to Boost uh, with the CMake is very, very terrible. We are just write our own CMake files for Boost completely with, in our snapshot. And uh, this is not a very pleasant procedure because we need to dive into the champ, dive into the uh, millions of lines, and so on and so on. It's, and uh, this is the, the, it makes a barrier to move to the uh, next uh, version of Boost. We are still using uh, Boost uh, 1.56. Uh, it's awful. Yeah, so the comment is that uh, building Boost with CMake is not very easy. And it's definitely a field of improvement, I agree. Uh, I, I sort of want to ask the question or a question, but we'll, we can echo it. Um, is it not possible to, to shell out to, to DJM? Is that a, a problem? Is that, is that an unacceptable solution? I'm asking you, like, to, you, you have to build it with CMake, you say. Is it possible just to shell out to D, DJM? And if, if not, why not? process for building this mm -hmm. is you run bjam, right? Can you exec bjam from CMA? Yes, yes, <coughs> we can, but, but you know, when you, when you need to find out some flags of first compilation and so on and so on, and so on it's, it's not a good idea, because it's not a trivial, it's not a trivial. So, and uh, we tried to do that bit, but it, it, it is not good to do well, the, the, the comment is that you could start BJAM or the, the boost build system environment from CMake, which I guess is a solution, but um, this is also, yeah, it's, it's not only about building, it's also about the support of finding uh, boost and being able to use boost with CMake. Um, this is done, I think, by CMake itself or by some people outside of the boost community, at least I was told by the person doing the CMake talk here, so I think there's definitely an improvement possible. Okay, any more questions? Then, thank you.